We gather here tonight to celebrate the opening of Monet and American Impressionism, an exhibition that explores the tremendous effect that Claude Monet had on an entire generation of American artists. Um, we are, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're mostly really thrilled to have the exhibition here because it ties so beautifully to our permanent collection. And I'll begin my talk tonight by discussing Impressionism in general, um, including how it began in France and then developed here in the United States, and then go going on to um, give an overview of the Telfair's history with the collecting of Impressionism, and then finally to go through the highlights of the exhibition and the five themes of the exhibition and explore how they reframe and change our understanding of works in our permanent collection. So first, Impressionism. Let's start with the theme that is central to the exhibition. So when I say Impressionism, what's the, the first word that pops into your mind? For me, it's probably color, maybe light. Um, for some people, it might be beautiful, elegant. Um, uh, some people might think conservative or, or safe or traditional. Um, but really, it might surprise you to hear that Impressionism was not always regarded as, as traditional or conventional. In fact, when it made its debut in Paris, it was regarded as outrageous, outlandish. It was the subject of criticism and even ridicule at the time. Um, but the, uh, the thinking of that has certainly evolved over time, and that's something I'll be, I'll be exploring here tonight. So the term Impressionism really relates very specifically to a specific group of artists who banded together um, in rebellion against the traditional academies and their exhibitions, their annual salon exhibitions that they organized. The, um, the salon was very traditional in its teachings, and it espoused a very realistic style of painting, very highly finished surfaces, extremely realistic renderings of scenes. And um, the artists that you see here, they've been working in a more experimental style, a little bit more progressive. And they became frustrated because their work had been rejected from the salon exhibitions numerous times. So they banded together, and in 1874, they founded the um, Anonymous Society of Painters, Sculptors, Engravers, etc. And they organized their own exhibition. And the term Impressionism specifically came from this one painting that was included in that first exhibition in 1874. This painting by Claude Monet was exhibited in that show at that time simply with the title Impression. And the term Impressionism came about as an insult, actually. A contemporary critic, Louis Leroy, uh, viewed the exhibition and, and did not think much of this painting. He heavily criticized it as being sketchy and unfinished and said, it's really just a mere impression of a scene. This is not a painting. It's just an impression. And, um, and hence the term Impressionism was coined. And the artists themselves, they, they embraced this label. They turned that criticism on its head by embracing the label and, and taking on the name of Impressionism, which is how they're still known to this present day. Um, they held that first exhibition in this, um, in this studio building that you see here, which was um, very stylish and even more importantly, very well illuminated. You can tell by the large windows there that they had beautiful light by which to view the paintings. And, um, and that was the first of eight exhibitions that these, that these artists exhibited together from 1874 to one final group show in 1886. So it can often be really difficult for us to remember why this style of painting was considered so radical and shocking at the time, because we're, we're so used to it now. And in fact, during all of our lifetimes, even if someone in here is 100 years old, still, I guarantee you that for your whole lifetime, Impressionism has been considered you know, not just an accepted, but truly a beloved and embraced part of the art historical canon. So let's look at some of the context in which these artists were working at the time. All of the paintings that you see here on the screen were painted in the 1880s, um, all within a few years of one another. Um, so the works on the left side of the screen are from the Telfair's permanent collection and are very typical examples of conservative academic style of painting that was prevalent at the time. Um, you see very highly finished surfaces, dark, somber color palettes. Um, both of these works were also executed on a very large monumental scale, uh, signifying their great importance. It 
that was also a trick for the artists to draw more attention to their work at the salons. The more real estate you could occupy on the wall, the more attention you got. Um, and, and really, the Impressionist works on the right, just two examples, a work by Monet and a work by Degas, could not be more different in, in any way. Uh, the color palette is softer and brighter. The brush strokes, whether it be by the paint in the Monet painting or the handling of the pastel in the Degas, are fluid and loose. The, um, the subject matter is not a grand scene from history. It's not a portrait of a famous person, but just an everyday landscape and just a, an unidentified woman bathing, really modest, simple scenes. And these works were also executed on a much smaller scale because the Impressionists were interested in taking their canvases out into nature, working on plain air outdoors, and depicting a subject as they saw it. While, while the light was, was passing across the trees, they wanted to capture it just at that moment. So the, the two types of works really could not differ in, in any more ways. They're, they're just vastly, vastly different. And hopefully that helps to illuminate why the Impressionist works were so shocking at the time. Um, but now I'd like to describe a little bit about um, Monet's personal style of Impressionism. It would be an overgeneralization to say that all of the French Impressionists worked in, in one style. And there were a number of factors and concerns that united the group. Um, but because Monet is the inspiration for the exhibition we're celebrating tonight, I'll talk a little bit about Monet's personal, personal brand of Impressionism, as it is beautifully exemplified by this um, cornerstone painting from the exhibition, which is from the Harns Permanent Collection, and was really the inspiration for the organization of the show. So one of the qualities you have here is the sunlight, that dappled sunlight that's passing through the trees that you see reflected in the beautiful shadows across the field of poppies and oats below. Brush strokes, you can see it on the screen here, but it's even more visible in person. The paint has been built up with layers. You can see every brush stroke. There's no blending of the paint and, and a finished surface like in the academic paintings. Every brush stroke is deliberately visible. You have the use of bright color. Even the areas in this painting that you might think would have been painted with black paint, even the darkest shadows, are really rendered with shades of blue and purple. Um, Monet was interested in experimenting with how, playing with how the eye perceives color and using these blues and purples in unexpected ways. And finally, the asymmetrical composition is another hallmark of Monet's style of Impressionism. We have this very deliberately off-centered, lopsided composition that, um, you know, is just enough to sort of catch you off guard and, and keep your attention. And many of the Impressionists employed this technique, and it's often linked with the rise of photography around the same time or slightly earlier. So like the French audiences in general, Americans were a little slow to embrace Impressionism. Um, at first, they were just as critical of it as the, the French critic that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first Americans to be exposed to Impressionism were, of course, those who happened to be in Paris to see the exhibitions of the group. And many of those were American art students who were studying abroad. Um, at that time in history, really, it was considered the only way to get a good artistic education was to travel abroad to Europe, where all the real artists were working, um, as the American school was still very much up and coming and not yet fully, fully established. So uh, these, um, these two artists are, are two examples of Americans who embraced the Impressionist aesthetic eventually, um, although at first there was a lot of harsh criticism. Um, one artist in particular, J. Alden Weir, um, viewed one of the early Impressionist shows in 1877, and he wrote a letter home to his family saying, I never in my life saw more horrible things. It was worse than a chamber of horrors. So clearly he was not impressed at first. And um, this is ironic because Weir did go on to become a very prominent Impressionist painter himself eventually, but he took some time getting there. Um, and then as time passed in the 1880s and 1890s, French Impressionist works were seen more widely by American audiences. There were several exhibitions organized in American cities like Boston and New York, and, and it became more accepted, more, more widely seen. And eventually by the 1890s, it became um, you know, an acceptable form of working for many American artists as well. And it went on to become actually tremendously popular. So the two works that we see here are great examples of Americans using that dappled sunlight, broken brush strokes, direct observation of nature, working in a smaller intimate scale, and an asymmetrical or cropped composition. You see all those hallmarks of Monet's style here in these two works. Um, and probably the most, the most formally organized group of American Impressionist painters is this group of men called the Ten, or the Ten American Painters. And um, they, uh, 
organized themselves around 1898 and exhibited together um, a number of times from 1898 to 1919. And this was sort of the heyday of American Impressionism. And they were reacting, like the French were rebelling against the, um, the academy, the Americans were rebelling against the Society of American Artists, and that organization's bias against the Impressionist style of painting. So they organized their own shows. And um, many, most of the painters you see here were exposed to Monet's work through travels and studies in France. A lot of them also went to Giverny. And um, many of them are included in the exhibition tonight, um, including Child Hassam, J. Alden Weir, John Henry Twachman, Willard Metcalf, William Merritt Chase, Frank Benson, Edmund Tarbell, and Joseph de Camp. So almost all of them are included in the present show. And Impressionism would go on to remain a tremendously popular style of painting for, for many decades, even long after it had fallen out of vogue in France and was no longer the, the ultimate avant-garde art movement. Uh, it was still trem enjoyed tremendous popularity with American audiences. And for the Telfair, Impressionism holds a really special place in our institutional history. Not only are many of our most beloved paintings from our permanent collection American Impressionist works, but when you think about it, Impressionism was really the first first modern progressive style of painting to ever enter the Telfair's collection in a serious way. Um, and so that brings us to the next part of my talk, which is Impressionism and Telfair Museums. So uh, Telfair Museums was, um, we always say how Telfair is the oldest public art museum in the South, and I don't think we often enough remind people that we are one of the oldest art museums in the country. Uh, when Mary Telfair drafted the, the first version of her will, first stating the idea of leaving the Telfair fortune to found an art museum, it was before even the Met in New York had been established. So it was really ahead of its time. Um, we were founded in um, 1883, opened in 1886, and so thinking back to the French Impressionists I was discussing before, this was a decade when Impressionism was, was flourishing in France, France and starting to catch on, just starting to catch on in the United States. Um, however, the Telfer did not start out collecting this modern progressive style of art. Um, it took us some time to get there, um, but um, we had much more conservative origins for our collection. And that is due to the vision of one man, Karl Brandt, who was our first director. Um, Brandt was German-born and educated over in Europe and was very much espoused the traditional academic style of painting and was a firm believer in that and also in the art historical um, um, uh, prioritization of genres that you see in the pyramid graphic on the screen. So traditionally, the most important type of painting, the, the bedrock for all painting, was uh, the history painting, these important subjects from uh, important events in the past. That was followed by portraiture, and then by the lesser genres of landscape painting, animal painting, and then a little still life, you know, unimportant up at the top there. Um, but still, they were all recognized as being part of that canon, and Brandt felt that they should all be represented in the Telfair's collection. So these actual details that you see are all from works that Brandt collected for the Telfair. And even in just these small details, you can see the style is very finished, very realistic, um, and certainly very academic in its treatment. And here's a great view of the Rotunda Gallery as it appeared during Karl Brandt's time, where it really even heightens the impact that these works had. And it really clearly shows you what his vision was for the museum. So uh, all of that changed for the museum um, after Karl Brandt passed away, and the museum decided that there weren't enough funds available to hire a new full-time director. They got together and started thinking about possible solutions to their problem of how to continue on. Um, and they did what many people do, which is exploit some personal connections. Um, so this man that we see on the screen, Gary Melchers, was a tremendously prominent artist in his day. And he also happened to be married to the Telfair's board president's niece. Um, so they, I'm sure, had a nice exchange of letters with Mr. Melchers, who was really just a very um, generous and, and good-tempered and kind-natured human being from everything I've ever read about him. And he agreed he served as the Telfair's fine arts advisor from 1906 through 1916, and then unofficially through the 1920s. So any museum purchases from that period were all collected under the auspices of Gary Melchers. Um, Melchers was a cosmopolitan figure. He 
traveled abroad extensively. He had homes in Holland, a studio in Germany. He studied in Paris. Uh, he had a studio in New York and spent the later years of his life at a country retreat in Virginia. Um, so he had a, a fairly cosmopolitan perspective and he brought a new vision to the Telfair. His vision was to collect not just European academic work, but to really add a whole mix of styles to the museum's permanent collection and really shake things up. So Melchers was able to do a lot with his fairly meager budget. He had about $1,500 a year, which I think even in that time was not a huge amount of money. Um, but he, uh, being an artist of some caliber himself, was negotiating peer-to-peer -peer with artists, with some of the top artists of the day, to negotiate some great bargains on some great purchases for the Telfair. And that resulted in the core of our, um, of our American Impressionist collection, of our uh, urban realism collection, and, and a great deal of other paintings as well. I love to reference this article here. This is from the New York Times in 1913. And it is an entire article dedicated just to the fact that Gary Melchers is back in town in New York after being in Europe. And we're going to catch up with him and hear about everything that's been going on in the art world and what he thinks about what's going on in America. I and mean, he was a prominent enough figure that this warranted an article of this size. Um, reading it is so interesting because the interviewer really harps on his every word and is just you know, hanging on his words, waiting to hear what he's going to say about the latest fashions in art abroad in Europe. So <clears throat> Melchers did acquire a wide variety of styles for the museum, but he stopped short of purchasing any work that was truly considered radical in its day. Uh, so you can think of cubism and more modernist works, none of that. He wasn't willing to go as far as that. Um, and it's pretty clear that he was not a huge fan of work in that style. Um, the interviewer asked him about his thoughts on, on some of the more modern artists, and um, the interviewer goes on to say that, um, I felt as if I had committed an indiscretion by asking. Um, and then Melchers looked grave. Uh, he said, I've seen very little of Matisse's paintings. Much of the work of that nature is bought only for speculative purposes, um, which you know is, is a very gentle and kind way of saying, I, I don't think very much of it. Um, although, of course, if you were speculating by purchasing Matisse's work at that time, you've done very well for yourself. Um, so it, it is what it is. Um, but he then goes on to wax poetic about the French Impressionists, including Monet specifically, and, and was a great admirer of Monet's work. So Melchers purchased not just the American Impressionist works that I'll talk about in a moment, but he purchased Art Nouveau, um, Pointillism, uh, Ashcan School painting, really a wide variety of styles, and deliberately mixed acquisitions by American artists with European artists, which was very new for the museum at the time. And it's also worth pointing out that Melchers did acquire a number of works by French Impressionists themselves, including Jean-Francois Raffaelli, um, who exhibited with the original French Impressionists a couple of times in the 1880s, and Gaston Latouche, who did not formally exhibit with that group, but was, was friendly with them, um, especially with Manet, and certainly was influenced by Degas, as you can see in this image of his dancers here. All three of these works are on view at the Telfair Academy on your next visit if you want to take a look at those and, and think about how they relate to some of the American works that Melchers purchased as well. So Melchers went on to purchase um, all six of the paintings that you he see here on the screen and about 70 paintings altogether for the museum. Um, but this was not a case of all of the conservative academic works that Braun had purchased going into storage to put out the bright, sunny Melchers Impressionist purchases. Really, the two collections were melded. And I thought it was really interesting to hear how our board president described the collection and the strengths of the collection in a report he wrote in 1917. He remarked um, about the combination of Braun and Melchers forming the collection. He said, from this variation of opinion and advice has resulted one of the points of excellence at the Academy. And then he describes how the, the museum doesn't really have any old masters, which is true. We've always collected the art of our time. Um, but he says, yet of modern art, omitting the latest extremists, we have all schools represented, from the conventional conservative academic school to the much admired impressionists of today. Um, so really, you can see this vision was in place from an early time, is this um, combining and complementing of Impressionism with earlier academic work. So here we have the, um, the six paintings from the Telfair's collection that are included in the Monet and American Impressionism exhibition. And in this final part of my talk, I'll touch on the five thematic groupings within that exhibition and how they help to illuminate and change our understanding of the Telfair's collection. 
So the first of the sections is the allure of Giverny. Now, Monet himself settled in Giverny in 1883 and went on to purchase a permanent home there in 1890. Um, this lovely painting, which I spoke about the style of at length, is an example of some of the really beautiful and captivating work that he produced in Giverny, uh, which was really the subject of some of his most compelling and beloved works. And then here are the two American works that I touched on briefly before. Um, they're by Theodore Robinson and Lilla Cabot Perry. They were two of the very earliest American artists to venture to Giverny to paint the same landscapes as Monet and to just be in the same atmosphere where this great, you know, legendary artist was living. Um, as I mentioned before, they really adopted a lot of the stylistic elements of Monet's work. Um, but also, uh, Perry herself was very instrumental in helping to popularize Monet's painting back here in the United States by facilitating exhibitions and generally spreading awareness. So these artists were contributing in this um, transatlantic dialogue as well. So Monet was not really thrilled that all of these Americans were finding their way to his rural, idyllic little town and setting up their easels and trying to be just like him. Um, so he really more tolerated their presence than anything. He did not teach any formal classes. Uh, a few of the artists he did get to befriend over time, but he didn't do any formal critiques or have formal relationships like that. Um, Frederick Hall Frisica was a slightly later American artist to go over to work in Giverny. And these two works from the Telfair's collection are excellent examples of the type of work he produced there. Uh, both of these works definitely owe a debt to Monet. Um, the garden scene, the garden umbrella, you can see it really relates to some of the garden images that Monet used with his own family as the subject, um, with the dappled sunlight and the, the lovely outdoor colors rendered really realistically and very specific to, to one specific time of day. Um, the work on the right, the hammock, is another great example of his style that's really distinct by that strong diagonal composition, the close cropping of the subject. You can see the, the maid or the, the nanny at the right with the baby is, is just about cut off from the scene, as is the table in the foreground. And, um, and also, of course, that blue light that pervades the entire canvas. At the time, it was, it was hugely criticized for this. People said that the, the skin of the woman was, was corpse-like and unappealing, and, um, and it really was, was not well received. This was a very experimental approach at that time. But you can see what he's doing, right? We've all been outside and we've seen sunlight cast its rays in a way that makes those shadows look, have everything look blue. And he was really interested in exploring the, the perception of color and playing with that in the work. So the next section is a country retreat. So in addition to working in Giverny, Monet also escaped to a number of different places in France to get out of the city and to, um, and to find inspiration for his work. And um, this particular painting is interesting for the, the really powerful way that he has done an incredibly high and restrictive horizon line. You just have a tiny sliver of sky there in the background. Um, and it really, he's forcing your eye to look at that tumultuous sea and all those waves down there in the foreground. Um, the composition is extremely dynamic. You're uh, looking at, um, you're looking down at a cottage that would have been used by a, um, a guard who was watching over, a customs official who was watching over the English Channel. This is the Normandy coast of France. Um, and this was created in 1882 when Monet spent uh, an early spring, uh, late winter, early spring, a few months in, um, in this town to gather inspiration for his work. And so a lot of the Americans who, um, who were using Monet's aesthetic also did not necessarily go to Giverny, like the works we saw in the earlier section. Um, a lot of them took Monet's idea of escaping from the city and, and finding a peaceful country place to work, and they applied it right here in the United States. And one of the most notable of these is um, William Merritt Chase, who founded one of America's very earliest art colonies in a summer art school out on the eastern end of Long Island in Shinnecock. And this would go on to become a vibrant artist colony. And it actually remains to this day on the eastern end of Long Island through the entire 20th century, really remained a vibrant gathering place for artists to come together. And not just in impressionistic styles, but it was also a hotbed for abstract expressionism. And it continues to, to be home to many artists working today. 
So Chase is also interesting for the, the comparison we're able to make between this oil in the exhibition and a small pastel from the Telfer's permanent collection that Gary Melcher's acquired for us out of the estate sale after, after William Merritt Chase's passing. So you can see it's the same subject. These are both the dunes at Shinnecock, but it's really interesting to note how the treatment of the subject differs when the artist is using pastel in a really loose, brushy manner as opposed to the larger, more finished oil painting that we see here. So the exhibition also sheds great light on Child Hassam, who is well represented in the Telfair's collection with two very important urban scenes of New York City. And Hassam, although a native of Boston, relocated to New York and was really best known for his views of New York. But he was also one who escaped to many different peaceful, idyllic locations, primarily throughout New England. Um, this one is New Hampshire. And, and sort of refreshed his mind and painted some rural subjects. So really by seeing some of these uh, more rural images that Hassan produced, it causes us to see the Telfair's urban scenes in a totally new light. Um, in this particular work, I also love the inclusion of that figure down there at the bottom, the bather, um, whose legs you can just make out through the water. It's really fabulous. And, um, and the scale that that figure brings to this entire composition changes it altogether. Um, it gives a much, a much more sense of a grandeur of the landscape and of the rock formation that he's swimming in front of. Metcalf is another artist from the Telfair's collection who is really seen in new light due to this exhibition. Our painting, Buttercup Time, is included in the show, and it's a really wonderful example of his application of the Impressionist aesthetic. You can see this field of buttercups shimmering in the sunlight. Um, and in fact, the, those white areas of paint in the foreground, those aren't white flowers. That's not actual white. That's the sunlight reflecting on the buttercups. So you can see it just kind of dances and moves when you walk in front of it. It's, um, it's you know, really quite quite noteworthy. But this exhibition includes an example from more than 30 years earlier in his career, that work that you see on the right at the top. And in that work, you can see such a strong contrast of light and shadow, the really bright, grassy area, as opposed to those dark shadows in the foreground. You can also see a very strong, dynamic, diagonal characteristic of the composition um, that really strengthens it. And overall, it's, it's just much more, um, much more contrast in the style within that painting than his later work is. But the exhibition also includes The Thawing Brook of 1917, which is from roughly the same period in his career as the Telfair's painting. And you can see that it's got that softer look that he was known for later in his career, but with a totally different subject, totally different color palette, and a completely different season that he's capturing. But you can see how he's used that same soft application of paint and his loose brushwork to, uh, to um, apply to not just the summer fields of, of buttercups, but also to a snowy brook in the winter. And that brings us to the vibrance of urbanism. So if you think about the time period during which these artists were working, it was really a, a dynamic and, and changing period in history. It was a time of great and rapid industrialization. And a lot of people, the cities were changing, the landscapes of the cities were changing, and, and people's lives were changing. And, and artists, being people of their era, were interested in exploring these changes in their art as well. And Monet was particularly known for this. Um, the work on the left, the Waterloo Bridge, is from a little bit later in his career, and it's one of, of more than a hundred images of the Bridges of London that he did during a trip there at that um, later point in his life. And the work on the right is in the suburbs of Paris, and it's definitely earlier in his career. And while you see many of the hallmarks of his work that we've been talking about tonight, it's really compelling to look at these two works at the same time and compare the looseness of the late work with the really tighter style of his early work and to note how that evolved. So other images included in the urbanism section are our own Child Hassam painting, The Avenue of the Allies. It's part of a series of flag paintings that Hassam did in celebration of the United States' entry into World War I. And it's definitely his best known series of works. You can see that he's applied the Impressionist techniques and concerns with, with light and with brush stroke to an urban subject in a really dynamic way. And at the same time, this, um, this painting is, is really interesting to view alongside 
alongside this painting by Gary Melchers of Bryant Park at Twilight. Now, Melchers, of course, played an important role in collecting works for the Telfair Museums, but he was also a tremendous artist in his own right, and because he was such a modest man, he did not acquire works by himself for the museum's collection. So we don't have as many of them as we would like to have to be able to create these comparisons. But Melchers was actually good friends with Hassam. They were both students as very young men in Paris at the same time, and they remained connected throughout their careers, often painting similar subjects at similar points in their careers. So it's illuminating to look at these two works together and think about the, the differences and similarities in perspective, color palette, and in brushstroke that they're using here. So also <clears throat> included in this exhibition, which I love, is this work by William Glackens. And Glackens is always much more strongly associated with the Ashcan school of urban realism, not so much with, um, with the beautiful American Impressionist painting that's known for more depictions of upper middle class figures and, um, and you know, sort of wealthy people of society. The Ashcan school artists were interested in a grittier depiction of contemporary life in contemporary cities. But this painting painting proves beautifully that artists can't be simply pigeonholed as belonging to one movement or another. And Glackens did do a significant amount of work in an impressionistic style, although he was using an urban subject matter, um, Washington Square in New York. This particular work certainly owes more in its style to Renoir than to Monet specifically, but the impressionist um, aesthetic is certainly there. And then the comfort of home is another really interesting section because one factor that united a lot of the Impressionist artists is that these modest scenes of domestic life, um, people, um, women with children, women in domestic interiors, that these were worthy subjects for fine art and for important art. Uh, that art did not have to depict uh, famous people from history or, or grand narratives from, uh, from the history textbooks. And this work here by Mary Cassatt is interesting because a contemporary viewer would look at this and think it looks it looks rather formal, right? Um, but at the time, it would have been seen as, as very informal due to the very casual pose of the two sitters. The daughter has her arm really casually thrown around her mother's neck. Um, and also the close cropping of the composition would have made it um, you know, really modern and fresh to a contemporary viewer. Cassatt is very important, not just as a very important artist in her own right, um, but as another artist who did a great deal to popularize Impressionist back in the United States. She was a native of Philadelphia and went to Paris and spent her entire career working in France um, in, for many reasons, probably uh, the most important of which was that artistic opportunities for women artists were much more plentiful in Paris at that time than they were in the United States. But she always retained her identity as an American and always thought of herself as an American and took a great interest in the type of art that was being shown in America and what, what we here in the United States were being exposed too. So she played an important role there as well. And this painting by um, Edmund Tarbell is one that um, uses the Impressionist aesthetic, but it also includes a, a fabulous element of psychological tension that is not something you see a lot in a lot of these American Impressionist works. You know, here you have a woman at the breakfast table who is slightly disheveled. You can see her gown hanging off her shoulder. Uh, you can see the, the man sitting across from her who, you know, they're not making eye contact. There's definitely some tension there. And revealingly, there's also a, a finger bowl on the table in front of the empty chair and a coat thrown over the chair, implying that somebody else was seated at the table and has hastily removed themselves. So the scene really raises more questions than it provides answers. And then the sort of tumult of the breakfast table itself contrasts with the maid in the background who's just going about her business in a very neat and orderly way. Really interesting work. And the exhibit also gives us the opportunity to compare sometimes very similar works by one artist to one another. So the work on the left is by Frederick Karl Friesica in the Telfair's permanent collection. And here we have this blue color palette and the blue light that we saw in some of Friesica's earlier work that is pervading the entire scene. But here he contrasts it with that mop of red hair on the figure. And the contrast between the blues and the red are really, are really the subject of this painting more than a, a literal depiction of the woman who is ostensibly the subject. Um, over on the, the right, we see another woman in a boudoir scene by Frisica, but here the figure is, is seated looking at the mirror. She's clothed in this very blue robe, and, um, and he has that same sort of blue light, but you can see how his experimentation with color differed from, from one work to the other, and really illuminating contrast. 
And also, it's a wonderful opportunity to see the beloved, unpretentious garden painting from Telfer's permanent collection by Gary Melchers, side by side with other images of domestic harmony that have similar color palettes and themes. In this case, you have two works that both combine a peaceful domestic scene with a lovely garden view. So you have the, um, the Miller figure, which is ostensibly an interior scene, but the fact that the, a large portion of the composition is taken up by the beautiful garden and the windows beyond, it lends an entirely different light to the work. And the Melchers is sort of the opposite. It's ostensibly a garden scene, but it's made a domestic scene by virtue of the fact that Melcher's wife, Corinne, is shown seated in the foreground working on her sewing. This work is really a testament to Melcher's happy and, um, and, and blissful domestic, domestic life himself. So the final section of the exhibition is a graphic legacy, and it deals with the subject of how these American Impressionists handled printmaking and approached printmaking in their careers. So in this section, you see the greatest divergence between Monet and the Impressionists, because Monet was not interested in engaging in printmaking with his own two hands. Um, he uh, cultivated sort of that mystique of the artist, and um, printmaking is sort of a dirty medium. You have to use dangerous chemicals. You have to roll up your sleeves and figure out how to work a press. Um, it's, it's a really demanding hands-on medium. And Monet did allow other artists to create lithographs or wood engravings of his work. Um, he sometimes created drawings himself that could be published in the, um, in the mass media, such as the image you see here. This is just a, a magazine published in 1883 that uh, reproduced a drawing by Monet. And, um, and this was really the extent of Monet's involvement with printmaking. This is in stark contrast to just about all of the other French Impressionist artists who were really interested in the artistic possibilities that printmaking offered. Not the least of which was Mary Cassatt, who did some beautiful work in both um, etching, dry point, and also in, um, in some of the color images, like the aquatint that you see on the right. So here, uh, Cassatt uses very similar subject matter to the paintings that she's best known for, which are, of course, these very tender depictions of mother and child. But here she uses a really distinctive technique. In the etching on the left, she's deliberately left the plate unfinished. And this forces the eye to really hone in on the subject itself and, and look where she wants you to look. And um, the work on the right in the omnibus is, um, it definitely illustrates her, her, the debt that she owed to Japanese woodblock printing, uh, which was another major aesthetic influence on her work. So in contrast to Cassatt, who uh, used subject matter that was very similar to the paintings that had made her famous, Frank Benson was an Impressionist painter who also worked extensively in prints, but used very different subject matter in his prints. He was known for, uh, for paintings of women in gardens, children outdoors, but for his prints, he focused entirely on sporting images. So hunters, as we see here, geese, ducks, and he really found his niche and is credited with inventing the genre of the sporting print. But to me, this work is important because it shows how the Impressionist aesthetic, which I've been talking about all night, and it has to do with color and brush stroke and, and um, a vibrant atmosphere, and, and how on earth do you render those things in black and white in a flat medium of etching where you can't build up a surface with brush strokes and with paint? And I think Benson answers that question beautifully in this image here, where you can see his interest in atmosphere, in the reflections in the water, and, and just that that dense atmosphere that envelops the figure here. And I'll conclude with two images by Child Hassam, um, the first of which is this image here of Fifth Avenue at noon. And this, to me, is, a, um, is really closely related to the Telfair's painting, The Avenue of the Allies, because you have a similar combination of a focus on architecture and, at the same time, these bustling figures crawling around the street below. Um, Hassam, like many of the American Impressionists who tackled printmaking, came to it much later in his career, when he was already very well established as a painter. And, uh, um, and his prints did not actually sell all that well during his lifetime, which is interesting because his paintings sold beautifully. Um, so, you know, his, his estate was left with a great number of prints after he had passed away. And that brings me to the, the last image I'll show you today. Um, this is one of 24 Hassam prints that was donated to the Telfair by Child Hassam's widow in 1940. 
And that was Maud Hassam's strategy for this large group of prints that she had after her husband passed. She divided them up and made very generous gifts to 40 different museums around the country, of which the Telfair was very happy to be one. Um, so she safeguarded his artistic legacy by entrusting these images to museums' permanent collections where they could continue to be a resource and to be studied by future generations of, of art admirers and of scholars. Um, and this print, if the Hassam, I mean, if the Benson before did a, a lovely job of showing the Impressionist aesthetic articulated in the black and white medium of printmaking, I think Hassam achieves that same level, if not exceeds it, with this particular image from the Telfair's permanent collection, which is included in the show. <clears throat> we have the dappled sunlight, we have the reflections in the water, um, his hallmark of the, uh, the beautiful natural landscape with that small figure inserted for scale, um, and it does a beautiful job of translating his aesthetic into the black and white mode of printmaking. So with that, um, I will conclude my talk this evening. I, I hope that this discussion has caused you to look at Impressionist painting, whether it be by Monet or by an American artist, in a new light. Um, because really, these artists, they, they were different in many ways. They were similar in many ways. But they all shared a passion for their work and an interest in sincerely engaging with the changing world around them. And they really changed the, the way that we viewed art even to this day. So thank you.